Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Lupkeman. I'm the head of the Strategic Foresight Hub at the ETH in Zurich. And it is my great privilege today to be in dialogue with a wonderful faculty member of our institution as part of the AI Plus series for the AI Research Center here at our institution. And that researcher is Professor Dr. Simon Schurle, and welcome, Simon. Thank you very much, Chris. Such a pleasure to be here today. It's great to see you, and I can't wait, really, because literally, to talk about AI and micro robots, and what you're doing at, in your research, and what you're trying to achieve. So, let's first start off with a couple of questions. You are in. Your lab is called the Responsive Biomedical Systems Lab. And what's its mission? What are you, what are you trying to do? Um, yeah, so we um, aim to design um, systems at a micro and nano scale um, that can respond to um, cues of a disease environment um, in order to give us diagnostic information or, um, um, or also deliver therapeutic payload. And we also um, design them in a way that they can respond to um, not only these disease cues, but also external um, cues, signals, um, energy that we can uh, control and transmit. I work a lot with acoustics um, or with um, acoustic energy and magnetic energy. Um, and in a way that we basically can communicate with these systems or also can control them and their modes of action. So, so you quite, so you use mag magnetic fields or acoustic waves to guide the micro nanobots inside of our bodies there can be guidance um there can be also interaction for for readout so in uh -huh. a nutshell basically uh -huh. micro and nano systems that can roam through the body to detect and treat disease um uh -huh. we have different um areas of applications and and concepts of interaction so there is um so for example we apply um we, we don't really got so Imagine also in your in your blood circulatory. As soon as you inject such a micro or nano robot, um, they're basically going to be dispersed. And um, I mean, you have in the aorta blood flow rates of a meter per second. It's extremely fast. Like any magnetic field, um, because they're so small and mag magnetic energy scales with volume, the forces we can apply are very small. So I'm not aiming to guide, or we're not working on guiding really through the vasculature um, and, and competing with these forces, but we're designing them in a way that we know how they behave in these, in these flows, the fluid dynamics, and then mm. capture them when kind of these velocities slow, do um, slow down, for example, in, in the vasculature and the small, um, sorry, in, in small capillaries. Um, and there we applied and very locally, like for example, in a, um, at a tumor site, we apply um, spe specific magnetic fields that can help these robots to extravasate out of the vasculature, go deeper into uh, a tumor, and um, basically, um, yeah, um, tackle one of the biggest problems in, in, in drug delivery, which is um, bringing your therapeutic payload effectively to, the, um, to, a, um, to a tumor site. So we know, for example, that only about 1% of the injected dose um, reaches really a tumor site, uh, for example, of a, of a chemotherapeutic, and the rest is all on, on a systemic burden that is, so, you know, on the liver and so on. So we're trying to be more targeted, yeah. So 1%. So if I, <laughs> if I have something that's in my little toe, and, they, and, they, and you, you inject me with something, only, even if you inject it right at my little toe, only 1% is going to actually go to the tumor? Yeah. So yes. So as, as especially for nanoscale um, um, molecular compounds on a nanoscale, mm -hmm. this is about what has been in what has been found. Um, Cause, yeah, essentially, because the rest just just disperses in the liquid. It's just a natural dispersion. No, no, no. It basically just all it distributes, and then the liver, as huge, our huge clearance organ, takes just up a lot, and then our immune cells take up um, such. Oh. Yeah. Such. Um, okay. For example one way to package some chemotherapeutic would be in, in little nano shells, but then those are um, um, encountered. So also, for example, um, our, um, uh, our mRNA based vaccines are wrapped in, in such lipid nano shells, but there's a lot of um, clearance that is happening basically in the body. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and especially then for, for a drug to be effective, you have 
so many drugs in the pipeline, but the, the problem is this tolerable dose that you can inject and then what really effectively gets to tumor sites. So we'll try to make therapy more effective by helping um, with micro robots um, to basically bring that cargo better to a tumor site. I love it. I love the terms you use sort of clearance and cargo and delivery. It's just like I'm, I feel like I'm watching a 747 you know, with the whole cargo coming in. But uh, just a really quick point of information for those who are listening. If you have a question which you'd like to pose or want me to pose to Simone, please put your question in the Q&A. And I will constantly be looking at, it's open right on my screen, and I'll constantly be taking those and we'll get to those in due course during our conversation. So I want to go back to this thing. So you said, this is just pure ignorance on my part. So one meter per second mm -hmm. is the velocity in your largest vessels like in the order like right at the heart i mean there's where the full and then the i mean you know it's a uh, five liters that's fast yeah i mean that's a lot of movement so that means in some of your robots if they're going through this turbulence that's i mean they're gonna have to be able to survive like going through niagara falls <laughs> yeah <Right? laughs> true yeah I mean, so when so so how how do you do that how do you design something I mean, to, to be able to do this. This is really kind yeah, of Yeah, cool. I mean, there's a lot um, that we're, I mean, it's not only that they survived this, but also that, it, that the material we use is biocompatible, right? And how, I mean, that we don't have a toxic mm. reaction to it and so on. So we, um, a lot of the, the basic components is actually what materials ourselves are made of, like lipids, um, um, that, that is basically, that we can synthetically, um, that we can synthesize, that you can synthetically uh, provide, and then we can form different um, yeah, nano shells or also larger assemblies. And, um, um, and then it's all about the, basically the, the chemistry with strong covalent bonds. We can then, you know, bring in, attach on the surface, maybe magnetic material, or we entrap it, encapsulate it because they're self-assembly mechanisms but mm -hmm. um we try to um yeah to basically work also with material that is um present in the body and is made to withstand um also such uh, um such forces and also is biocompatible in that sense so to, this is again question of ignorance a lipid mm -hmm. what is a lipid i mean like you're um a, a, basically a fatty acid molecule that you okay yeah so you, a hunk, of, a hunk of fat. <laughs> <That's> what, <laughs> in a sense, yeah. So you're making fat, fat bots. <laughs> <laughs> Components of fat, fat. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, just, um, okay. <laughs> so, but you you bring up something that's quite interesting. It says uh, you you're using natural, to basically designing with our with our bodies in mind. Mm -hmm. All right. So. This isn't like the little fantastic voyage robot capsule, which gets gets controlled and running through. This is actually a, a living thing that you're putting inside of us. All right. So this is a true. We also work with a living organisms. We come to that. Maybe maybe so. Mm -hmm. um, one step back. Um, no, it's not that we the the engineering principles we use um, for a macro robot wouldn't work very well at the scale uh, we're working. A, it's getting. Um, difficult to machine uh, even thinking about batteries and motors or um having gears and little like how does this kind of imagine it's it's um it's very hard to um yeah to to machine this at the scale and so kind of these robots are more like think of it of, of something that is um an entity that can basically a molecular construct or a, a nanomaterials construct it can be like um that responds to a certain input cue applies a certain processing rule and then there's a certain output um that is that is then determined by this processing rule this could be if there's um um enzyme a there's a certain uh, reaction meaning there is um, a cleavage or an opening or a, a release a co basically a chemical can be a chemical reaction that is then happening mm -hmm. that then um leads to an opening of a of a nano shell or leads to a um like we work with so, so to be very concrete like we for example restrain a one of these 
lipid here it's now a micro bubble it is, has even a gas core and we restrain it through chemical bonds and those respond to for example to a certain enzyme that is a like a biomarker for a certain disease and when it's cleaved off it can all of a sudden very nicely oscillate and so we get a very different mm. nonlinear um, um, signal back in our acoustic spectrum when we send in acoustic waves and this is mm. so we can basically oh now our robot switched on or it tells us mm. Um, there is enzyme A active because we have this reaction to give, hmm. yeah, give one hmm. So you can use that to actually find, can you use that to, to, to yeah. detect? Yes, we use it to detect and we also use ah. it to deliver. Like we have um, oh, okay. these, two, um, these two modes, yeah. So that could be like one day I might just be able to pop one of your nano or microbot pills and it will then find the tumor for me. Like we use a thermometer now. Um, hope, hopefully, yeah. I mean, that that is indeed the idea: roam and, and detect, yeah, um, and um, um, and find where um, if there's certain um, upregulations of these biomarkers. And that's actually maybe I'm, I'm doing it too fast of a step, but where artificial intelligence can also help us by identifying, figuring out these. I mean, all this searching for what, what is. Um, finding suitable biomarker signals of disease that that mm. can be very distinct for us as an input signal. This is the information we need, and um, and then with that we can work to basically in, uh, trans or integrate this into our concepts of detection. But I basically need to to find these um, um, these specific targets and 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 um, biomarkers that we can use. Yep. So when it finds something that I can tell to play James Brown, if it's cancerous, I can play <laughs> Led Zeppelin if it's not, right? So yeah. it's Stairway to Heaven if it's really deadly and I'm going <laughs> to die. So can, is, that, is that kind of when you're talking acoustics? Is that what we mean? <laughs> well, for us, it would be more of a yeah, brightening of the signal um, if it's there. That's right now the mode. You basically get a, um, yeah. But, but uh, you could... We but, could okay, couple it music, certainly. <laughs> I want you to. Ch I'm challenging you now to James yeah. Brown. You do a little bit of James Brown, then you know I'm gonna. I'll, I'll, we can talk about it. But but a very serious question is is when we're looking at this. I'm sure many will go. Oh, but you're putting something weird in my body. Should, you know, Simon, come on. Should I be afraid of this, or is this sort of like the like a measles vaccine, or you know? I mean, the, 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 um. So there has so a there is a lot of um, nano and micro around us. What we already take up naturally, mm -hmm. just what's um, mm -hmm. you know from um, from, from that's what's in the air, what's in in, in that form. Um, yep. But we have um, and then we have a lot that's already in our in our daily lives in in sunscreen, uh, you know, um, titanium mm -hmm. oxide, zinc oxide, nanoparticle formulations, in toothpaste, in um, mm. in food and there are these liposomes I was talking about to help basically the melting behavior of chocolate um, mm. to preserve certain uh, natural flavors or like there's a lot on that's already used um, yeah. there's, and also um, and around us and and the way it's basically be, and we build up our micro robots on substances and materials that have been that are already in use, but we know um, it doesn't harm, and that's that's basically cleared, you know. And and as I said, also materials that's all that we find in our body, right? Or there's also we work also with um, uh, with iron oxide um, because uh, you might know that's also has been used already as a contrast agent in MRI. This helps. Yeah. Um, it's very um, not the strongest magnetic interaction. I, I wish I could use other materials, but they are. They would be toxic, so so we we you know we navigate in that space, and then we need to become more creative about okay, if that material isn't responding so strong, how can I work with my external uh, magnetic instrumentation to um, or different concepts to make to make it work? But mm -hmm. so I'm saying um, yes, let's be um, in the end, what will come out for uh, for the patient should be nothing to be concerned of because we have to do our due diligence. And um, and and we work with material and mechanisms that basically these robots get cleared out of the body yeah. naturally, as many yeah. other things in our body are also um, basically cleared for the liver. Or also your drugs, you know, that would be just on a bit of a smaller scale, like not at a 
a nanorobot is basically a, some, to some extent also an extension of, of molecular constructs. At some point, it reaches just a nanoscale, mm -hmm. right? Like as an... Um, just um, aggregates up. Yeah, in that yeah. sense. Yeah, so let me, but let me ask you what that was, Simon. This is not meant to be a mean or unfair question, but you know, we lots of drugs we take, like if you take uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen or something like that, and a certain part your body absorbs and the rest you urinate out. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming a real issue in many major cities where this water can, can literally cannot be cleaned because, yeah. of the, because of the nutraceuticals which are sitting in them what how should we be afraid of that or i mean here i would say that we would then at least since we know um we would have more of a handle to then also you know filter and and fish them out again like for example if there's magnetic material involved you can mm. um you you could, and you could imagine if that would really become it would if it would come to a point that it's more used in a routine way right i mean yeah. for me it, at some point I could envision having really micro nano and micro nano robots that we can uh, take up from the comfort of our home to um, have early detection of of uh, cancer or mm -hmm. um, basically monitoring of our health state. And yes, you would have basically you need, you would need to think about that, and then you could think about actually having filters included in your toilet um, that that would cash out any um, uh, filter out any. Um, magnetic material which would come from there yeah. uh, from these systems i think sure. that's uh, that's something definitely important to think about but now also we um it is really in, intended in um um in for ex you know in, in therapy or um helping in therapy monitoring with these diagnostic micro robots that can tell us more about um a disease state right without taking an invasive biopsy where we use this communication um and so it would be in a in a very controlled environment mm -hmm. as of now no, I think I think that's that's really cool, and I, and you know I, I'm waiting for the time when we have this as an issue. <laughs> yeah, because you know because it's really quite interesting. Like most of I've, all three of my four grandparents have all passed of uh, cancer, so odds are pretty right. high that I will get yeah. cancer of some kind. And it'd be really interesting to know that there could be some kind of un unintrusive way that we could take a little nanobot or microbot and I swallow that little pill and every once in a while it tells me or my toilet tells me, hey, you're yeah. doing okay, you know, yeah. that's part of your vision. So this is just for, again, for my, remind me the difference between a nanobot and a microbot. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm really, um, for me, it's very important to make the distinction just because there was quite a hype on, on nanotechnology and everything was nano that was actually micro. So, I mean, these are two just, I mean, it's just defining the, the, our asymmetric system for the size, mm -hmm. but there are just nanorobots that are really between 10 and, or usually between 10 and hundreds of nanometers. Um, mm -hmm. And they um, have specifically in, uh, in, in like tumor accumulation or anything that should go out of the vasculature, they have this advantage because they can fit quite, the size allows you to fit quite well through gaps, for example, in your blood vasculature and your um, mm -hmm. endothelial mm -hmm. layer. But as a micro robot would be then in the micron, so thousand nanometers to 10,000 or larger, but usually we, we play in, our, in, in their uh, size range of a thousand nanometers to uh, maximum 5,000, um, 10,000 nanometers, so micron to 10 micron. And to give you a comparison, your red blood cells are around six to eight micrometers. So this is about that size and they are doing quite well in the vasculature. <laughs> Let's uh, mm -hmm. put it that way. And um, and this is about um, just also thinking what you want to target. This um, the size range um, mm -hmm. gives you then an idea. Yeah. So it's almost like the nano ones could like sneak in. Yeah. In that and sense. The micros sort of are attached from outside and release. Yeah. Yeah. That that so my okay so. I can now. So, can these nanobots at the moment go? Can you already then go in and repair? So, right now they're at detection. Now, this is what you're working on. Can mm -hmm. can they repair membranes, cell membranes, and pieces of our body already? Do we, are we already at that point? Um, I mean, with repair, it's basically if can they, in in my definition, can they more effectively and targeted bring a molecule like a, a drug or a or um, either for repair um, that recruits immune 
um, cells, right? That is your innate mm. repair system or, um, or that helps to basically, um, or an anti-cancer toxin that just reduces then the presence of, of malfunctioning cells or um, of cancer cells. So yes, that's what we're also actively mm. working on. And, um, and here, and um, that might be a good moment to bring that in, but here's also where we make use of um, not only then now synthetic systems that we can control very well, but actually also living systems. So here we work, um, for example, with, or concretely with bacteria that um, have, um, you know, I said before, it's so difficult to machine a nanomotor and they have the most astonishing molecule, I mean, a molecular motor um, that's, Beautiful. I would love to show that <laughs> video now. But understanding really how they propel their their cilia and flagella, and like, yeah. or if you just think of um, like let's take an E. coli bacterium that's in our our most common gut bacteria, um, and they have this this beautiful molecular motor that's basically spinning the flagella, which allows this um uh, forward propulsion very effectively. Because what I also think what I mentioned before is. Um, you know, the, the engineering principles we use to have a macro robot moving around, like, for example, through a fluid, mm -hmm. right? If you would be a, a macro robot, you would maybe say, okay, um, how do fish move? They move quite well. They have the symmetric um, yeah. motion and they can move that way forward. Now, if you would shrink that fish into a nano or micro fish to go through your vasculature, it basically wouldn't move forward. And that is because uh, we are in a, in a different fluid, um, fluid dynamics regime, the low Reynolds number regime, where the symmetric motion, where you need basically a non-reciprocal asymmetric motion. And that is what, what you see, how Mike, what micro, of course, nature um, has evolved their, their mechanisms for microorganisms to move effectively. And that is that bacteria have exactly such a helical tail and this non-reciprocal uh, motion. And so first we worked also on making such artificial bacteria. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. basically had a, um, I was, this was during my PhD, we worked on many other groups in the, in the world are also trying to mimic that um, because it's of course very smart from, uh, from nature, but having a helical tail and then for example, a magnetic head or a magnetic or the tail is magnetic and you can apply rotational magnetic fields. And then you have also just turning motion and move forward. And now this is exactly where then, you know, the motor would be outside would be your rotational magnetic field. And that can be huge. You could be in a, in a hacked MRI that basically applies such rotational magnetic fields or have your own instrumentation. Um, but then still there's a lot what you need to do. Um, you need the position feedback, orientation feedback to align your rotational fields in a way that you have this forward motion. You know, there's a lot of complexity right now that especially if you think of you want to have many of these robots effectively moving in a swarm to a target region would be extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And now there are, so why not using bacteria themselves? We are we have more bacteria than, than human cells in, in our hmm. body, um, not in the vasculature, uh, because that would be sepsis. But what we do know is we can, um, or what is really a, a big direction now in, in the field is engineering microbes specifically for diagnostics and therapy hmm. and having them also in the bloodstream in a controlled um, way. It's called living therapeutics um, hmm. or living therapeutic, um, um, uh, hmm. living bioprobots bioproducts it has its own um 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 uh, regulatory affairs and um and, and and regulation and it's coming up and we're kind of working on a on this intersection of now living uh, using these living um systems um in combination with um with nanomaterials to control them and to combine almost artificial intelligence and natural intelligence hmm. That's really cool. I like to the com the combination of both. And but when you were saying that, I was trying to think: How do you actually see where your first of all they're tiny? Yeah. How do you actually see where they are? How do you know where they are? Yeah. And, and how so, do you guide them? Yeah. yeah. But this is where um, again before when I mentioned we can work with acoustic energy, right? We get a yeah. specific signal back. It's different from what um, from what your other what, what uh, tissue response we can work with magnetic um here we work with magnetic material so we have um you get a very distinct signal um then uh then back we can work with um uh, inductive detection schemes um, um or also in an mri you would see them but basically we work we label them in a way with material that we can use for control and for um detection so 
So, so I'm just sitting here thinking about like Star Trek, I think, with the tricorder that, you know, Dr. McCoy, I think, was, we take his, is this how you do it? And you kind of like scan something over your body or? Um, again, because of the whole, because of these very fast blood flow rates, we basically, the approach is we sit, we focus on the tumor site with our magnetic field set up and for bypassing bacteria modulated with our drug cargo or that have onboard <laughs> toxin production, we then, um, they basically get captured by this magnetic field um, actuation and then can, oh. uh, we can help enrich them in the tumor. But so, you know, we try to make use of, um, yeah, we, we don't work against these high forces of the body, but we're yeah. informed sitting at a tumor site. So, so, what you re so you play James Brown and they come to the dance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're doing i got it okay that's kind of cool so can they talk to each other can these micro robots at that scale or nano robots actually communicate or coordinate with each other or do you need still need to do that externally you're doing yeah. that they i mean not. there's um different forms that uh, naturally occur so there's dipole dipole interaction if i give the magnetic material and i can tune and tailor this and they're you know, there's size and the integration of this material, how strong that interaction is. And um, uh, there's also, if we work with living um, entities like, like bacteria, there's quorum sensing. So they have a, they have sensors for density and they can, they can, you can integrate genetic circuits um, where when they feel this density that they basically lie. So they die and they release a drug that they hmm. have operated. So here uh, we work hmm. together with synthetic biologists that hand us over these bacteria that have this quorum sensing circuit in, and for example, a toxin production, and then we attach the magnetic material and help this whole um, accumulation at tumor site. So, so they actually have an awareness. It's not yes. sure if they talk to each other, but yeah. there's an awareness yes. there. Yeah. Huh. That's really cool. Hmm. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I always want to ask the question, so when am I going to be able to go down to my local co-op or Migros or down to the Apoteke and buy this? When, how, where, where is this going to be? From yeah. A, you know, I, how, I mean, how far are we? Are we just in dreams? Are we still dreaming? Are we still, you know? I mean, the whole um, aspect of using bacteria for cancer therapy, for example, um, mm. is in clinical mm. trials. Um, the modulated forms that we're working on is, of course, in a, a step further, probably 10 extra years, or um, to use something really, as you're describing, from the comfort of your home for like some um, diagnostics or at-home monitoring, I think would be more like... I don't know. These predictions are always so hard to make, but um, as we're right now, and in, in, in not even approval of of, diag of the diagnostics could yeah. be could be thirty, could be forty. Okay, well, we'll just pretend. Yeah. Yeah, never forget the question. So then, <laughs> okay, no, 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 I'm just curious, you know, because like I said, I will probably die of cancer, and I'd love to be able to know when that's starting to happen. It'd be, it might even already know. So we talk a lot about personalized medicine. Now, is this a direction towards? personalized medicine or is this something which would be quite generic and it and you, you and i can take the same pill or how do you set your interpretation of that Tim? yeah i mean my my hope is that um these systems can help us to get more information about an individual patient state or an individual person state right so we know for example um let's say there are certain um uh biomarkers affiliated with a disease, but when does this occur at a certain moment for a person, get this information basically on an in individual um, level and the levels that person has in, in that sense. Um, so, and, and, and also in, you know, when you use them for, for example, therapy monitoring or how does this person react to a certain um, one fits all drug but how does this, and we, we do this, like, for example, in, in cancer therapy, right? And not a lot of the monitoring, then is there tumor regression, but it takes a lot of time to monitor. So can we have something that tells us more quickly, um, um, basically how, how that patient is responding? And there's a lot of information in, for example, these, um, we work a lot with, with proteases. It's a, a very insightful class of, um, of enzymes that um, are affiliated with a range of, I mean, they basically orchestrate all 
almost they're involved in almost all processes of our um, uh, of our body of cell division and cell growth and and also cell death. But their dysregulation, like for example, in cancer, like cancer cells, um, secrete a lot of these proteases to help their um, invasion, like to degrade the matrix where they're around and to um, and so if we can detect that and and you know you you get information about a metastatic potential and does this level go back or forth but you um, go up or down basically you need to have a system that can measure this locally and not in the blood because the signal of the tumor you know gets washed out and all the the blood your um, of your circulation so so basically how can we a figure out which are these important enzymes you want to measure this dysregulation what means dysregulation on for an individual um, person state mm -hmm. Um, and then designing, um, and this is where all artificial intelligence comes in, designing these, um, how can we measure this? And there are, for example, certain, um, there are peptides, these are amino acid sequences that, um, uh, that um, uh, amino acids that get basically cleaved by, um, uh, by certain proteases. And these cleavage patterns and um, and which peptide and which protease fit very well for, you know, to... Um, as, as basically, so basically, how can we, <laughs> the brain... There's a rabbit hole. I'm seeing a rabbit hole coming. Yeah, uh -oh, I'm sorry, okay. sorry. I'm trying to... to <laughs> whoa, whoa, watch to out. ...to the artificial intelligence part, <laughs> what's, what's so important, because they can build the brain of our robots or the heart of our robots, right? So we need to have this kind of um, uh, bring and integrate, respond to a disease signal. And this response link or, or a subject is basically... Here now a peptide, and these these amino these sequences of amino acids that construct this peptide mm -hmm. that fits to a protease. There, um, um, there are a lot of mutations you can try how to arrange these twenty amino acids <laughs> that we have, mm -hmm. and and there's a lot of um, um, uh, basically identifying. This is where artificial intelligence can help us, or combinations of these peptides that we integrate in our robots to detect these enzymes, and and this is something where we right now are in. In, um, in discussions with other groups that focus basically on their AI techniques, right? But that we can apply it into um, to our systems to help inform the design um, and to be very yeah. specific. So you're essentially giving them the fitness function they require in order to hone in on the various combinations which they might discover. Yeah, in a way. Is that, yeah. And that was all your questions about how that is more uh, better to help in personalized medicine. Yes, I think by by having a, we need to figure out um, what are common signals, though. But then they should help us to detect them uh, more specifically um, for individuals and in response to certain broadband therapeutic approaches. Mm -hmm. So someone's asked a question, which is interesting: is how much computational power do these micro robots have? <laughs> um, yeah, that is a great question. So I think that all, that is mostly all done before, uh, in a in a sense that there is not much computational power in 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 that sense. Um, and then in the external instrumentation, right? Like when we get like this, um, and I mentioned before, our micro bubble system that is constrained, and then there is cleavage. Then we we record, we we get acoustic nonlinear um, acoustic signals back that we need to. Um, to interpret and analyze and the kinetics of that. So the computational power would be in the external systems and less in the, in the robot. It actually has more of a, um, I wouldn't say on off. There's still a kinetic of this on off state, hmm. if that makes sense. I keep thinking, I think of when, I, when you're describing what you're doing to me, I don't think of a robot. Mm. Because I think a robot going, nur, 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 nur. I mean, it's just my 1960s version of what a robot is. So how for you, why why are these robots? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. And a chemist might look at this and say, that's not a, you know, our material scientist. That's not a, that's not a robot. That's for me a, 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 um, a molecular, I mean, a molecular construct or a material construct. But for me, it's basically that still from my perspective as an engineer and having done my PhD in, in micro robotics and, and, and robotics, there's this, this really fundamental principle of there's an input queue, there's a processing rule, there's an output, and that is, um, and they're put in service for us, right? The definition of a robot is basically that it is a system in service for, uh, for the human. Um, and in mm -hmm. that sense, they're, they're having these specific 
um, tasks following these rules. Um, there can be some, it, it depends on what scale you work, but also these, what I described before, these artificial bacteria that we were working on, there's lots mm -hmm. of interesting kinematics and also the robotics, of course, in the control systems outside, right? If we couple then also detection, for example, through magnetic induction or um, with um, where and how we apply our magnetic field, you come to, um, yeah, basically position feedback, response feedback and, and closed loop control. And you have a lot of the, the robotics and the outside instrumentation. Okay, but that's fine. It's quite interesting. I've hosted a few conversations and uh, not everyone shares exactly the same definition of robot. That's true, yeah. No, and it's, it's quite intriguing, the, 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 the spectrum. And I really liked your, there's a signal, there's a response, and there's an action, and, you know, and I think that's really quite interesting. So we've been talking, you, your research, I, I believe, is mostly focused on cancer, but there are many different parts to our bodies, such as they also get damaged, and we can detect that. I just said, you know, like ligaments get torn or nerves get ripped. Yeah. Can you, is there, are there nano robots can, that can also repair our, like the, the question is on ion channels in neurons? Can we get, can we get that specific? Um, and so um, a, we don't only focus on cancer. For example, we have a project on rheumatoid arthritis or on infection detection, integration of such nano robots um, on, on, for example, on implant material potentially to help us read out during the, the, during the recovery process, right, that, uh, and things like that. On a um, neuron level or iron chain level, it gets very, I mean, first we have to, you're definitely on a nano level because you have to bypass the blood-brain barrier, um, and then you're on a, on a specificity level right now for, for in vivo to really reach that point in a controlled manner, which is still not there. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, but such control in in vitro um, with different tools and studying that on a single cell level, yes, and that's where also nano uh, robotics um, helps. Hmm, that's pretty cool. So, but so we're talking about these in a, in a wonderful way, but. There's always the unintended consequence. Could could these kind of go? Could could your little robots misbehave? They get angry at mom, <laughs> and then they kind of go, Rrr, and or they could they evolve themselves into like a young teenager and rebel? <laughs> um, there would be really from right now these. These systems are quite um, complex. It's simple in 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 their way that there's no. Um, there could be ma mainly that there is a malf malfunction in terms of that they cannot respond anymore because of they get attached to um, through protein adsorption to somewhere and I can't get them off. But then they would be taken up by phagocytes anyway. So it's not that um, the 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 way we work, um, the, the worst that could happen or is also that a toxic, that a, basically a toxin as a payload for um, in, in cancer therapy would be re released already off target somewhere, but then you would be just as bad as any other um, uh, are there, are these... that you already, um, that was already done before. Um, so th in that sense, not there's something on the, the living um, entities um, that are used that there can be mutations, changes um, mm -hmm. of them, but that's actually um, also thanks to um, uh, synthetic biology in a, in a way well controlled, we can include also kill switches um, that there's an, an um, uh, or very selective antibiotics to that strain that has been, uh, that has been modified. So um, without trying to be, without being critical, I, I would say that we have quite good control mechanisms mm -hmm. and such but, evolution on essence is not really hard. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, but if we think our natural system likes to flush stuff out, this is why we've got our kidneys and livers and everything else, right, to, and to either urinate or defecate those bits once they've been captured, and you said only 1% of a, of a contemporary therapy actually gets and the rest gets flushed or or, mm -hmm. or how do we how do you can because i think i i think i know the answer to this but you how do you control the fact that your molecules also get expelled so what percentage actually get there when you can control them and you like 90 percent or like 
four percent. No, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, it's it's more in, in like an order of magnitude, or um, like you know, if it's like ten like percent, or or maybe. Um, but that is a big dose difference or i mean that is um mm. um already that that really changes um, what you can do or i can um or maybe can uh, can even be a bit yeah more selective but what's interesting is also really a lot about um the choice of size material surface functionalization surface charge um, um that defines how long things can be in circulation and uh, and how they get filtered where they get filtered anything smaller than five nanometer goes through the kidney anything that, you know like how how that isn't secreted in the urine maybe i want to have a, a a satellite so i worked on a system that actually had basically a, a nano shell and it was a satellite system that was cleaved off traveled into the urine and then i detected it there and it only you know and that kind of mechanism told us that if i can detect something in the urine this event was happening so this mm. enzyme is active there so mm. these are ways of yeah thinking about you know making use of these different um filter systems you have in the body to then mm -hmm. um, read out signals so that's actually that's actually kind of cool because then you have to really look at the body as this closed i'll call it a semi-closed system yeah yeah and so you're able to use the different filter typologies different as indicators of act of activity that you might have discovered. You can, yes. Interesting. That's really cool. So there's another question, which I have no idea. I'm just going to read it to you, okay? Is it possible to introduce a metabolic cycle with the help of this method to, for example, cure a lactose intolerance? Oui. Wow, that's a, indeed a very interesting question. I've mm. never thought about it. Um, that is <laughs> not something we had in a horizon and for metabol. I mean, then you would have, I guess it would be more than on a level to have that almost integrate integrate or uptake and with any food one would take. Um, maybe there would be something on helping that digestion, whether this, yeah, in, in, in that mm. sense, nothing I have thought about before and I don't want to um, uh, say too much in, in uh, also sure. medical territory I, I don't know um, much um, but principle to deliver um, digestive enzymes in an encapsulated form that can go with food could be a could, could be a possibility be, yeah. be a possibility yeah you focus mostly on the bloodstream and making increasing effectiveness within the bloodstream but the digestive tract has, has not been where you really focused. That's right. But there's, for example, also, um, uh, yeah, um, a lot we're also under, you know, with um, especially with living therapeutics, um, where you can, uh, you can basically in a form you already do this by taking your probiotic uh, yogurts, mm -hmm. or they are now also um, in, in, in pill form um, to, um, Mm. To, to enrich e either your um, gut flora, but there's also now ways. There's actually colleagues at the BSC are working on and on using that in a way for for diagnostics and also having then some readout through things that basically move through your um, gastrointestinal tract. Mm. Mm. You know, unfortunately, when I, at 50, I started becoming gluten intolerant, which means I have a really difficult time with beer, yeah. which, which is a terrible thing <laughs> yeah. in the summertime for me. So one day, if you could work on that one, Simone, I'd be really happy. All right. All right. So, <laughs> I'll have to be solved cancer. Great. <laughs> yeah. Solve cancer, then work on gluten, then yeah. gluten intolerance. Then you could make myself and my. All right. So um, who is going to have access to this? Is this going to be the rich, the rich tip of the pyramid, or is this going to be something which you believe will be available as a therapeutic or a diagnostic for? The general public i mean that's that is the aim um and we also see it from uh support from pharma i mean if you look right now you can already now so many drugs are or as of now so many drugs especially in cancer are incredibly expensive right so if we find ways of um um having more effective delivery having we need less of it we need um or we need um um uh, maybe that's a, a hard example also, but in in the way it's what we're aiming for is not that it, the, the parts we use um, that is and it should be compatible with then to encapsulate transport drugs that are already developed. So this shouldn't be more expensive or or, or only for um, selected population. Question is maybe more if it goes towards then of course the whole 
well-being monitoring um, that would require also, you know, um, more into infrastructure. As we, I mean, we didn't talk that so ex explicitly about it, but if you would have an integrated sensors in your toilet or in your mirror as you breathe out and there's response to what you ingested before and reactions and so on, then um, that, of course, would be would be um, to more in a, um, a more selective. But the general um, idea is is to have this broadly accessible and actually move forward um, um, the healthcare, yeah, uh, improve the healthcare system, and also, you know, yeah. It sounds to me if you if you can come up with a way to deliver these extremely expensive drugs ten at a ten time, you know, factor more efficiently and effectively, that's pretty significant. Well, the other maybe another concrete example I I mentioned before it is acoustic readout we do with ultrasound, right? So ultrasound mm -hmm. is a quite ubiquitous instrument bright, broadly distributed now you can even get um some some uh with some reader connected to your to your cell phone like it's it's this the prices for ultrasound are going really tremendously down now the what we would want to detect is basically what you would otherwise you can also detect in a pet scan it's i'm not you know but a pet scan is very that's a re, uh, resource um heavy and and the time and the uh, um uh the time and, and money that goes into it for for such a scan is is so much higher. So basically, moving to use, having these micro robotic systems uh, to help us use at a low cost point of care instrumentation um, to help us more frequent diagnosis, cheaper diagnosis in that sense um, would be actually an argument to also have this accessible, more accessible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, can your uh, can yours or can other? Can you talk about delivery? Of something, I'm assuming. I'm assuming then you have a prepackaged item, which you're delivering. Right? It means that you have to add the therapeutic before you in, in, inject the robot into the body. Is that correct? I mean, there are yeah. So, for example, we work again with these lipid nano shells, liposomes that can entrap any mm -hmm. um, um, dilute. Um, any drug in solution, right? So, so you can have those that are that is then packaged, and then we can, for example, if we work with our live in cancer therapy with our bacteria as this living vehicle, then we have um, we do basically uh, a covalent um, functionalization mm. of the membrane with these packages and send them in in that way. Mm. So can so can you actually take, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, can you actually take? A package like like uh, an axon and bring it to another place. Like, can you actually go? Could you go and grab and steer? Like, okay, I'm gonna grab this and move. Like, like a construct, like a, I guess it's like a bulldozer. Yeah, I mean, in in vitro on like in single cell level, there's a lot in what can be done. We call it in magnetic tweezers. If we then work with magnetic material, and you can have this gradient control. But in the human brain, such dense tissue knows, but like the forces are huge. Their interaction with other cells, so there is right. I couldn't imagine any any way, at least with the technologies I work, how to do that. Um, but for fundamental studies um, on a on a, um, yeah in vitro in a in addition single cell levels, there's well to move axons around. Um, it's also <laughs> tricky, but there we have more control about this really. Uh, potential maneuvering and and detachment and attachment. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So you talk about lipids and things like. So what resources? So I'm going to ask like, what resources are needed to actually make these things? Do you just like take a little snip of my? belly fat and make some or what no, it is, they come in powder form you can you can order them we have um we have done a we have chemical synthesis lab there's also like an installed schlenk line to make our magnetic nanoparticles at a synthesis with thermal decomposition we have um and then we basically have solvents we dissolve this we shake it we um do you do yeah we do chemistry there self-assembly processes then of these lipids to form these layers we observe what we got in different instrumentation machinery to make sure they formed these structures um, with transmission electron microscopes. We look at them and uh, um, yeah, that is so the infrastructure it requires is actually a, a, a chemistry lab, um, lots of um, instrumentation for um, characterization 
um, and in parts also a um, you know a clean room for like nanostructure mm. uh, fabrication. That's cool. I'm glad you. I was kind of hoping I could donate some belly fat, but oh well. <laughs> I could. So, um, you know, as a researcher, what you're trying to do is also reset our understanding of normal. And this is one of the things you're working very hard to do. This so was with drug delivery and discovery, and and uh, not drug discovery, but you know, uh, discovery in our bodies. What are some of the barriers? The biggest barriers, or a couple of the the hurdles you're tr you see in front of you right now to jump over to get through and what might you need to get through those barriers mm, great question um <laughs> where to start i mean there's definitely also the um uh, regulatory um aspects where still a lot we need to to learn about um um some of the, the materials and behavior and in, in, the, in the body and um, having these, um, I, I think that is definitely always a, a, um, a huge step how from, you know, from, or how effective is it in a, in a human? Like we do then mm -hmm. these studies in, in as sophisticated in vitro models, animal models, and so on. Um, uh, then also the, um, some of the magnetic instrumentation to scale it up to human scale, their, their resources um, and infrastructure I need, and then to make sure also on dissemination of these systems so that that it's becoming basically a, a, a broadly accepted new technology, right, to, to use. So there's a lot of um, uh, resistance, I think also not resistance, I mean, to, to until you show that point that you're better than, or that is this improvement how that all um, economically competes against what's right now existing, right? So there's a lot that has to be shown to then come really to this broadly rolled out um, uh, method like an MRI that is now so broadly used in a, in yep. a sense. Um, then, um, and then of course the um, understanding uh, like for certain, this hunt for biomarkers, I mean, this is also a, as I said before, a key ingredient for what our robot should detect or to watch the, to what they should respond. And um, there's just uh, so much more we need to to learn in the complexity of um, of this regulation of these proteases, as I mentioned before. Like for example, we are now interested in 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 uh, um, helping therapy monitoring in in, in extreme severe uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And there's um, so many different like so many papers going out and different enzymes that would be important for that but but really having a lot of data and understanding these these profiles and patterns or whether there is a common denominator what is a common denominator or how different is this between individual uh, people and that is again um our connection also to artificial intelligence to help um make sense of um part of things that have been already found and then also of, of new data um, and, and collecting that from many people <clears throat> or helping through collections from many different data sets to, um, to consolidate that. Well, it sounds like the perfect moment there to start working with more artificial intelligence scientists and data, um, data jockeys with affection to understand how to, man, under, to sift through these, this, this magnitude of data, yeah. which you're just describing, yeah. Yeah, and that is also not, you know, for me, other challenges are, um, of course, also on energy transfer effectively. I, I talked a little bit about this, you know, but that the material we can use, our design space is limited, what works in the body, what is biocompatible. Mm. So how can I increase the forces that I can really apply? What are mm. uh, techniques for that? So that's why making use of mm. living machineries and, and their propulsion, but then helping them in a way of where they go. And But there's a lot on... Um, on the engineering side where I have to overcome really physical, physiological barriers of extracation mm. out of the blood vessel into dense tumor stroma um, and so on. Um, but I, I wanted to also, yeah, make sure this connection also to date. So some of our puzzle pieces of in the end design of a, of a micro or nano robot for medicine involves so many disciplines. And, um, and, and mm. I think artificial intelligence gives us just also a tool for one aspect of it yeah. Um, to to help move quicker forward, yeah, yeah more effectively. Well, Simon, the time always goes by so fast yes. when I get the, the pleasure of chatting with you. And again, I've learned so much. 
Um, I want to thank you very much for your, your passion, your continued focus, and I wish you really all the best with overcoming some of those barriers and finding the right colleagues to work with to solve some of those challenges. So it's really cool. Thanks so much. It's been truly a pleasure. And um, well, thanks to everyone attending this webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody who has who has joined us. You can find Simone's Spotlight also on the AI Center's website, and um, I encourage you to go check it out, where she talks a lot more about the Proteuses and some of their actions and potential. And so, with that, I will say, stay safe, drink lots of water, eat an apple, and we will see you soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.